Good morning. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Anne-Christine and I got back from Morocco where we were scouting out uh, a number of areas to run a workshop there in February 2021. Now, I start or we start our workshops again a week on Friday and we're going to be in the field for five weeks in Scotland and in Spain. Now, uh, part of my job obviously means working images, scouting out locations, running workshops, producing YouTube videos. So it's really a full-time kind of situation. Now, it's a beautiful day outside with it snowing and it's the first kind of winter weather we've had, but today I have to process some images. Now, on the screen here, you can see I've got about 36 different photographs because I need to produce uh, a brochure for the, for the workshop next year. So what I've decided to do is screen record some of this process, not all of it because it would take me all day. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to work three separate images from Morocco that I took a couple of weeks ago. And they're going to become part of the, the brochure for the tour. So let's dig in here. This is kind of all the images that I'm going to work, uh, but I have narrowed it down to these three, uh, which is basically a kind of nice uh, rock and bush uh, in evening light, uh, first light on the sand dunes, and then this is a focus stack, and, and I think it could be quite a graphical kind of black and white. It's got lots of layers. So two of these are focus stacked, and one of them is a kind of straight up. So I'm just going to dive straight in here. Now, I haven't done anything to these images, so these are the raw files. Um, I haven't really got an idea where I'm going to take them creatively, so what you're going to see here is a kind of an evolution of how the images are going to work. Now, as I narrate these, it's it can be difficult to be creative and talk about it at the same time, uh, but I'll try and kind of keep you up to speed with what I'm doing. So if I go into the develop module, uh, the dynamic range of this is pretty good. I don't want it to get too bright uh, because it was kind of last light and it was kind of eveningy. So I, I do want it to keep a sort of a slightly subdued feel. Now, something I talk an awful lot about in processing are transitions from one thing to another thing, and that can be from dark to light, from texture to smooth, from cool to warm. Uh, so these transitions are excellent ways to create interest. And the thing with compositions is it doesn't matter whether you're using rules or guidelines or you just shoot with your gut uh, and you do it innately. The point is, is that we end up with something that we personally find ple pleasant or harmonious or it speaks to us in a way uh, that, that is meaningful. So I'm going to kind of start working this image and see where it goes. Now, if I cool this image, you can see the foreground uh, starts to look better because it gets a kind of moody, sort of slightly subdued feel. But we've lost some of the... Uh, we've made the sky a bit too blue. Now, at the moment, I'm really just looking at the foreground uh, and I can worry about the background later. So if I just drop... You know, how blue does something need to be before you know that it's too blue? Uh, if I bring in a gradient here and just cool that whole front section again and that creates that kind of uh, cooler in the foreground and warmer in the background and that kind of makes sense. If you think about it, the shadows down here are going to be cooler uh, and this area of rock here and this area of rock on the right are, are obviously catching the light a little bit more. We can add luminosity and saturation selectively. So that's lightening. If I darken those warmer colors, you can see that they start to get more saturated, but they've lost some of their luminosity. So I can bring luminosity back in like that. If the color starts getting a bit wacky, we can pull that down using the hue slider. Now, there's so many different ways of adjusting contrast and luminosity. Uh, and realistically, I can't show you them all in this particular video. What I am going to do, however, is to add some texture 
and some clarity to that foreground. Check, yep, so that's my blacks, so I don't want them to clip too much. I don't mind a little bit of clipping in the deepest shadows, but I don't want too much of it. And add some light in there. Now, everything I do is really just creating luminosity and contrast. Um, and the beauty of that is, is that you're just doing the same thing again and again and again. I'll just add a little bit more texture to that background. It just didn't look quite as sharp as I would like it. This needs to be detailed because it's rocks and rocks kind of need texture. Um, if you leave out the texture, then they tend to look a little bit wishy-washy. So I'm kind of quite happy with how that looks now. Uh, I think this would make an excellent black and white photograph, but I'm going to leave it in colour for now. So realistically, whether we uh, prefer the original photograph or we prefer the, this, the, the other photograph, it's immaterial, you know, this is what you're getting. <laughs> you know, this is, we don't show, we typically don't show our raw files. Um, so all people really see is our worked images, um, you know, and therefore we make them the way we want them to look. I kind of like this, I like the way the, the light's catching these bushes and so forth, and I kind of like that. I could spend maybe a bit more time on this and make it somewhat different, but I'm gonna move on. Now, this one is an awful lot more straightforward. Now, I'm gonna select both of these files just because they need to be focus stacked. And when you focus stack images, you need to make sure that you're making the same adjustments to both files before you take them into Photoshop to blend. <clears throat> so I am going to hit the D key to take me into the develop module. Now, this image is way more straightforward. I'm just gonna make this super moody, but I am gonna bring up some detail in the foreground, just to make that a little bit brighter. Because, you know, we can always darken it later. Now this dark band that we can see there, that is kind of caused by a graduated filter I was using. And this is a common effect, is that if you use graduated filters, uh, you can create this dark line. This is, I think it's a hard edge, like a reverse graduated filter or something like that. So it's darker at the bottom than it is at the top. If I just drag down a gradient and pull up the blacks slightly, and maybe my shadows. Now there is some darkening on that horizon. Now that's natural. Now if I pull up those shadows, you can see quite dramatically now that's two gradients, of course, but this top gradient has really helped with the sky. Uh, and if I just click my range mask and pull down the highlights a little, what that's gonna do is ignore that bit of the, the tonal range. Uh, so really that, that uh, gradient is really only affecting the, the darkest colors here, which has helped to really brighten up that horizon line. Now, because I had auto sync, hit there. If I hit the G key, you will see that both of the images have had the same effects applied. Now, you can see the way they move around like that. That is basically because when you change the focal length, uh, the focus point, then the, the image bump bounces around, but the, the perspective has changed. So what I'm gonna do is with them both selected, I'm gonna right click edit in Adobe Photoshop. When it, Adobe Photoshop opens these images, it opens them in layers, or it would have done if I had opened them in layers in Photoshop. What's gonna happen is because I just said edit in Photoshop, it's just gonna open them as two separate files on two separate uh, images. Now that's fine, I'll just copy them over. There's a quicker way of doing this, which is open as layers in Photoshop. Now I have two images here this looks like the background, so I will call that the background, and this one is gonna be the foreground. So I'm just gonna do Command or Control A, Command and Control C, and then when I open up the new image, I can just go Command or Control V, and that brings in that. That is the foreground image, that is the background image. So I can see where those two are. Now, focus stacking in Photoshop is super easy. 
and this is how we do it. Select both the layers, go to Edit, Auto Align Layers. What that's going to do is warp and distort both the images to make sure that the content becomes aligned with itself. And you can see that we've now got this edge around the side that's compensating for the focal point shift. Now, something that most people don't do or do next is to go edit auto blend layers. I prefer sticking in an extra step, which is command control J to create copies of those two. And then I'm going to pop them in a group and I'm gonna hide the group. And what that's done is it means I've got copies of the original files that are aligned, but they're not going to blend and I'll explain why in a minute. Both images selected again, edit, auto blend layers, and you leave that at the default of stacked images. And what this is gonna do is blend the images for focus. And you know, Photoshop generally does an excellent job by looking at the sharp areas of both photographs and, and kind of creating masks that, that basically make that happen. Now, once we have a sharp, version of this file, we can zoom in and just kind of look around and generally it looks like it's done a pretty good job. There's a lot of footprints through there, but we'll have to ignore those for now. It's done a pretty good job. Basically what would happen is if I ended up with areas that were kind of blotchy, sometimes you can see like kind of artifacts or, you know, patches. So there's a bit there. You can see, I don't know if that's very obvious for you. So if I go through and turn on my group and turn off the background layer, yeah, oddly enough, I don't have a particular, right. So this foreground copy has a sharper version of that. If I turn it off, you can see this horrible artifact. Uh, if I turn it on, so basically I don't need to see all of that, but I can paint in again where I didn't have that stuff. So I'm gonna hold down the Alt key and hit the layer mask. Uh, sorry, that should have created a black mask, but it did not. Sorry, I've hold, held down the wrong key. It's still holding down the wrong key. There we go. Holding down the Alt key and clicking the mask button uh, brings up a black mask. And then all I need is a white brush and I'll use kind of medium to high opacity, normal blending mode. And I can just paint in with the, now this is the foreground image getting painted back in now, if this is just the foreground image, I know that I can paint anywhere in the front here and it's just gonna over, over, uh, over paint the, the bit that the blend had done. And what that's done is it means I've, I've kind of got rid of any of those little artifacts and stuff that uh, the blend had created. So I'm kind of happy with this and we can move forward. Layer, flatten image. I'm not a big fan of keeping tons and tons of layers. Now, I've been doing videos on dodging and burning uh, in uh, using the history brush. In this particular image, I don't quite know whether I need to do it yet. So I'm just gonna make some basic adjustments to kind of get the feel I want. I wanna make it just really kind of moody. Uh, and I am going to get a black brush. Hitting the X key when you have the brush uh, selected uh, will change it from a white brush to a black brush. And I'm just gonna dial down the opacity in the flow here and paint in some of that light back into those areas. So what I'm doing is like kind of undoing some of that stuff that I've done. Uh, so that looks okay. I'm gonna paint a little bit of light back into there too. The good thing with dodging and burning is that as long as you don't do crazy stuff in terms of where you put it, then it's uh, it's really quite straightforward. Um, 
Good. So I'm going to flatten that again. And I think I'm just going to finish this off in Lightroom. So I'll hit Command S. Really, I only use Photoshop. When I'm doing things quickly, I use Photoshop to do the stuff I can't really do very well in Lightroom. So I'll hit Command W and Command Q and that will take me back into Lightroom and this is the image that we had. Now, something I've talked about a lot is transitions. I've talked about it in the first image, we'll talk about it in the second. And what I'm gonna do is make this feel like it has more depth. The foreground can be made to feel closer by adding texture, adding clarity, adding contrast, adding luminosity, any of those effects. So if I turn that off, you can see it kind of looks a bit flat. If I turn them on, it brings that foreground to life. Now, what we're doing is we're basically saying, this is what it feels like to stand there. By adding texture, contrast, clarity, luminosity to your foregrounds, it's basically telling the brain, look here. Um, and by making it feel textured and gritty, it is sand, of course, then it feels more immediate. Now, this stuff in the back is naturally quite glowy, and we can kind of enhance the feeling of that glowiness by doing the opposite. We can take off a little bit of clarity. We can take off a little bit of texture. We can take down the dehaze and have a little play with the white balance. And what this really does is it makes it feel more distant. And by making it feel more distant, that enhances that feeling of depth. So here we have the image, and I think I'll stop here for this particular one um, so we can move on to the third example. But again, we're kind of getting there. Now, the third one is a straight up focus stack. Uh, you can see here this foreground layer is very detailed, but the back is not sharp at all. This is focused for the middle, and this image is focused for the back. And you can see there's a raven, I think it's a brown-necked raven, which is a Moroccan kind of speciality. Um, and by, this is going to be black and white. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to do everything except the focus stack here in Lightroom. So let's just work this one. And I'm going to make this super contrasty just because this is going to be uh, a really high contrast black and white image. And I might do a little trick at the end which is using luminosity mask, which is kind of cool. Right, so I'm just gonna make it quite contrasty to start. Now, if you're making black and white conversions, it can really help to make a completely uh, over the top color version, because what you're doing is you're giving the black and white conversion software lots and lots of interesting color data. And the more color you have, the more dramatic the black and white can be. Now going over the top in the color version doesn't really matter because we're getting rid of the color anyway. Uh, okay, so this time with all three files selected and we can see there that's the effect being applied to all three. I go edit and open as layers in Photoshop, which is the step I didn't do the first time. Uh, I can't remember how many times I've done this in my life, but we still make mistakes from time to time, probably because I'm talking to you guys while I'm trying to work. Now, this is going to be an exact repeat of the previous steps, um, and therefore you're going to see it twice. Um, some of these processes just have to be done. You can, there's no shortcut to them. So we go edit, auto align layers with all three images selected, leave it at auto. Uh, and depending on how powerful your computer is, this can take a short time or a long time. Sorry, I'm just fiddling with stuff that's stuck to my foot. Right, so that's the images aligned. I'm going to do exactly the same as I did before. Command J, stick them in a group and hide it. That is a step that will save you tons of hassle. If you're blending water like waves, so if you're focus stacking a beach, if you don't have those uh, copy layers, you're gonna end up with blotchy because 
Photoshop just can't patch waves that are moving. So it really gives you an opportunity to fine tune that perfectly. That step will save you a ton of time. Uh, right, three selected, edit, auto blend, and this will create the focus stack. And once we have the focus stack, we will do an analysis to see if there's any uh, blotchiness uh, and whether there is or not remains to be seen. Morocco was fabulous. It, it, it was truly fabulous. It, it far exceeded my expectations. Uh, I don't tend to have a lot of expectations. I love to go places that uh, are new to me without um, kind of thinking what I'm going to shoot or anything like that. This has done a pretty good job. Um, there is a blurry area around the front where the thing has been resized, uh, but there's no blotchiness. So I'm just going to flatten my layers. I am going to open my Tony Kuiper uh, Rapid Mask and Combo on the TK7. And this is going to give me some extra tools that are really, really useful. Now, um, if I zoom in here, you can see there's this uh, blurry edge and that's basically the, the, uh, the when the things get resized, when they're getting blended, it creates this edge where there wasn't enough data to basically uh, make uh, a good quality image. So all I'm going to do here is I'm just going to warp them. Uh, I'm going to go Command A, Command T, and rather than cropping, I'm just going to, oh, hold on. I don't know why that didn't work. There we go. This is the warp tool. It's a little shortcut. Uh, and that's just going to allow me to fine tune. Now, I shoot with an icon D850 which has about 47 megapixels or so. And it gives me an awful lot of potential to kind of move stuff around. And as you can see at the same time, I'm kind of just redistributing some of these pixels a little bit to just change the geometry slightly of the composition. Is this a line in the sand? That's for you to decide. Uh, wide angled lenses change the perspective of things. Um, if you went to these dunes, it's not going to look overly different. That's a line in the sand that each of you can decide. I'm not, I'm not the morality police and people can basically do what they want with images. Um, I don't think that's a critical uh, abuse of my powers. I am, however, just going to clone out with the spot healing brush, just that little bit of dark sand there and that little spot there. There are a couple of little marks in the sand. It's not, there was no footprints in this area, but there were camels and um, they have big feet. So I can just tidy up a few of those little spots just to clean it up a little bit. Foregrounds are, uh, you got to be really careful with foreground. Something that's significant in a foreground can really catch the eye way too much. Now, I do want to keep this cleanish. You know, the new spot healing brush in um, Adobe Photoshop is just ridiculous. It just does such a good job. It's super smart now. And, you know, I think that's done a reasonably good job of cleaning this up. Right. We are getting there. I'm going to make this black and white. Uh, it was always my intention to do so. And I will do that using Nick Silver FX Pro. I've been using Nick for, oh God, well over a decade, at least 15 years, um, because I like it. it. It's a great interface and it works really well. Now, color filters, this is something that's a throwback from when we used to use film and we used to stick color filters in front of black and white film to change the tonal range, to alter luminosity and contrast. And we can mirror those effects. If I hit the blue one, I'm going to make all that orange sand go dark uh, because I'm blocking the orange light with the blue filter, whereas the blue light is passing straight through. If I use a yellow filter conversely, 
or an orange or a red, all of those are going to let that warm light through and magnify it. They're going to make it more luminous. Uh, and that creates huge amounts of contrast. If I take that filter off, you can see that things were a little bit middle of the roadish. As soon as I hit that red filter, all of that luminosity comes through in those wonderful colors. And we've created this beautiful uh, textured and detailed. Now, I don't use presets on the right hand side if I, I just don't. Uh, but I do like to do things manually with the global adjustments. If you don't see these, just click on the little arrows next to the names and that will bring those up. I'm going to add some structure to my highlights. I'm going to add some structure to my shadows. And that's not a huge adjustment. I'm now going to brighten my highlights because I want to create more contrast. Now, you can go into the loop and click on... Right, so the darkest pixels in this image are zone three. There are no zone, uh, no, sorry, zone two. And you can see that with the hashing. There are no zone one and there are no zone zero. So I can take the brightness of my shadows down quite a bit. And you'll see I've probably taken those, I've taken the darkest down to zone one. So I've got nothing in zone zero, which doesn't particularly bother me too much. Now, again, my brightest pixels are in zone eight. So I can continue increasing the brightness of my whites and I can actually brighten this image quite a lot and kind of make it quite high key, which means I can darken some of my midtones and shadows some more. And I can click OK. And the little trick I'm going to show you is how to make black and white images using Nick, uh, sorry, using the Tony Kuiper uh, luminosity mask panel. Um, and I can use the masking capacity to create a really little fine tuned black and white image and then make pixels out of that. Uh, so it's a, an amazing feature that Tony brought in maybe two or three iterations of the panel before. Uh, the work that Tony has done on the whole luminosity and moving contemporary landscape forward, uh, contemporary landscape photography forward, just cannot go without praise. He, he's done so much. So it's a pleasure to be using this panel. Now, I have got a black and white version now, which is perfectly acceptable but I am going to go into Tony Kuiper's TK7 panel and I'm going to hit the composite button and that is creating uh, what are known as loom lock masks and rapid masks and they appear in your channels. The rapid mask is basically showing you what mask you are making. Oh, <laughs> that's what happens when you hit your, your uh, MIDI keyboard when you're in the middle of recording a video. Now, I can make any mask I want uh, by selecting variations of this image. And once you have a selection, you can adjust it and basically do whatever you want with it. So I can make this even more dramatic and contrasty. So I can make it look any way I want and then I can click this button and there's this button that says mask to pixels. So now I now have, uh, this was a, a luminosity mask and now it's a black and white image. Uh, and I'm gonna use that as my final black and white image. Uh, if I want to, I can hit the composite button again and I can take some of these darker tones. So this is like a, t a zone two. Uh, this is like the 25% brightest, uh, darkest pixels in the image. And I'm just gonna create a short curve and I'm gonna screen those just to brighten those up a little bit. And then I'll vary the opacity to just dial that back. And what I'm doing here is I'm just making a, a slight adjustment to the shadows to make them less black because they were kind of dark. And I think I am just going to stick a group on top of that and with a black brush, I'm just going to paint that out from the foreground. 
So because you can't mask a mask, I'm going to I've put this in a group and I can actually paint out the effect on the group mask and that way it allows me to make the foreground shadows darker again. Uh, the initial luminosity adjustment that I did was brightening the shadows in the foreground and the background but it was the background ones that really needed done the most and therefore by painting it back out in the foreground it's a, it creates that depth again. Realistically foreground shadows should be darker than, <clears throat> pardon me, foreground shadows should be darker than background shadows. <clears throat> and that allows us now to see that the shadows in the background are actually a little bit more open than they are in the foreground. <clears throat> if I save this now back into Lightroom, you're going to be able to see that I've created three images that are more or less uh, representative of where I am at this moment in time talking to you and basically by making images that are all they can ever be is a snapshot in time if I worked them again now they'd probably be different but you can only really produce something that's a kind of representation of who you are in any given moment now I'm going to carry on processing the rest of the images uh, to create the workshop page for the for the tour of Morocco that will be starting this time next year, well February, early February next year. I hope you like these three images, I hope you found the video useful. Uh, I absolutely would urge you to subscribe to this channel, I would love to get some thumbs up and click the bell notifications so you'll get notifications when I post new content. There will be another video along on Sunday where I look at the second part of the history brush uh, where we're going to start making adjustments and then using our history states and history brush to um, basically paint in effects at will using a very, very powerful technique. And we're still all going to be on a single layer. So tune in on Sunday for the next video. Uh, but for now, I need to finish off processing about another 20 images for the workshop page. Have a great week, everyone, and I'll be back with you on Sunday.